Hello and welcome to Dialogue. A recent study has drawn attention to years of steady economic decline in Europe, which is now manifesting in noticeable ways. Europeans are becoming poorer. What are the driving factors behind Europe's economic decline? How are EU states coping with their economic hardships as individual countries and also as a bloc? And are the Europeans able to arrest the downward trend of poverty? To help us answer these questions, I'm joined today by Ano Foucault, Senior Lecturer in Economics at Lancaster University, Kay Newfeld, Head of Forecasting and Thought Leadership at the Center for Economics and Business Research, and Professor Ian Beck from the London School of Economics and Political Science. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qinduo. Welcome to Dialogue. A recent Wall Street Journal article titled, Europeans are becoming poorer, and quote, yes, we are all worse off. Uh, this article has sparked hated discussion online um, across the Atlantic. Uh, let's uh, start with Yim. You know, uh, first of all, I want to have your response to the report saying that you know Europeans are becoming poorer. Well, my response is that, in some ways, it's accurate because things like productivity growth have slowed over the last ten to fifteen years. The Europeans are aging as a society, and that tends to diminish the potential for GDP growth. But it's also somewhat misleading because it depends on a particular point in time when the calculation was done, which, as I understand it, was 2021, looking at the particular data from the study that was done. 2021 was a year in which the dollar was high. If you did the same study now with the dollar much lower, you get a very different result. So you have to be very cautious about these kinds of figures. I also noticed that uh, in, in one particular piece of uh, misleading information, they classify Luxembourg and Ireland as being by far the most prosperous EU countries. Luxembourg may be, but Luxembourg is a strange country in that the working population is bigger than the actual population because people commute in from the neighboring countries. So it exaggerates the GDP per capita. In Ireland's case, it's very misleading because a large part of Ireland's activity happens through multinationals and they take profits out. So the Irish prefer to use a figure called GNI star, which puts, puts them much lower, lower down the league table. In short, be very careful with these kinds of comparisons. Well, uh, very good to hear those uh, contexts. Contexts are important in understanding the story. Uh, so, uh, no, Foucault, uh, or do you agree? I mean, there are a bit, maybe, uh, let's say, some exaggeration in terms of uh, uh, characterizing the popularization of the Europeans here? Well, I think it's always a, a fun comparison to make. Americans and Europeans life, like to compare each other, different lifestyles. And it's true that Europe, through the austerity years after the, the financial crisis, through COVID, just like the US, but through the energy crisis, which has been more important mm -hmm. in Europe comparatively than in the US, has suffered more than that you see sluggish growth. But in the end, in the grand scheme of things, uh, the relevance of um, European economy is not necessarily about comparison with the US. Like in the world, you are a country, um, a continent of, you know, uh, an association of countries, 300 million people. Uh, you are going to be smaller and smaller comparatively in the world economy simply because you expect the rest of the world to grow. And so, what is the role of Europe? Why? Why are so many people still attracted to come to Europe? And how do you find your place in the world? So, Europe at the moment has been framing itself as the great regulator, so the law, the regulations of Europe are somehow applied everywhere in the world. Also, in general, a sense of a liberal democracy. So people from all around the world are still attracted to come to Europe, and Europe is trying to stay relevant today. And I think comparing yourself to the US is something that is becoming dangerous, not only in terms of politics, but also in terms of a subsidies war at the moment, trying to invest and steal each other factories. It may be sometimes a bit of a fake conflict between two blocks with a lot of things in common, while in the grand scheme of things in the world, um, they seem to have a lot of uh, things to agree on. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Kay, do, you, I mean, uh, again, a good point here. I mean, a partial uh, comparison sometimes is incomplete, and then you hear an incomplete story that could be misleading. Uh, uh, so, but with that being said, do you think the, the people, 
uh, I mean the public, people on the street, do they feel somehow they are worsening off in terms of their daily lives or daily consumption? Well, I think there might be that impression, um, but I think that's something that's been experienced, you know, in, in many countries the world over, because we are going through um, a historic bout of high inflation, and we have been uh, since you know, the summer of 2021, really. And you see that in Europe, we have a lot of labor disputes because wages are not keeping pace with inflation. Um, and that means basically that households are worse off. They have less money available for consumption. And uh, these losses need to be distributed somehow. So the government can decide whether you know it's either businesses who need to take the loss, or the government um, can you know you know have subsidies or, or higher benefits, uh, so take a bit of the loss for themselves, or it is households who who, who um, have to bear the brunt of that loss. And I think that experience has been quite acute here. We haven't seen inflation in the double digits, um, you know, since the 70s in Europe. And it's um, been quite an incisive uh, experience. Luckily, uh, now inflation is falling. Uh, the central banks have acted uh, by raising interest rates to combat this inflation, and it's starting to show its um, effects. However, we also feel the side effects here in Europe, which is slowing GDP growth. Um, so we have, you know, for example, Germany, who has not experienced any growth since the third quarter of last year, and is teetering on the edge of recession. Um, overall, the European growth outlook is quite subdued for this year and the next year um, because of these uh, you know, side effects of the high inflation and of the high interest rates uh, that have been imposed in order to combat inflation. So I think people, you know, they, they notice that, you know, the money is not going as far and, and therefore that, that impression of being worse off uh, is justified to a certain extent. Mm -hmm, to some extent. Uh, uh, Ian, if you look at the comparison, let's say, in absolute terms, uh, in terms of GDP or the size of the economy, uh, you know, according to the Wall Street Journal story, America's economy is nearly twice the size of the 20 nation Eurozone's economy, according uh, to the IMF. You know, that's uh, the figure they quoted here. But they were similar in 2008, about 15 years ago. So uh, let's say the U.S. economy is much larger now than th that of the Eurozone? It's bigger, but it's not twice as big. And I don't know where they've managed to manufacture that statistic from because it doesn't make sense. I think it's, it's worth pointing out that the European economy overall is just about back to where it was pre-pandemic in the level of economic activity. So it's not a calamity. It's not as though we've suddenly fallen off a cliff and Europe is now back to a very small percentage of what it was previously. We've just lost the equivalent of three or four years growth, which you might have expected to have pushed it up a bit more. But you need to be very careful with some of these comparisons for a different reason, which is mentioned in the report, but not really followed up. And that is the purchasing power of different countries is very different. You can you can spend $100 in Bulgaria and you will get far more from it than if you spend $100 in Denmark or Luxembourg, which are very expensive countries. So be careful with these things as well. What I think we're now seeing is the effect of the pandemic and particularly the war in Ukraine, which has moved the terms of trade, something the economists refer to, which is the price you obtain for your exports compared with the price you pay for your imports. Because of the surge in oil prices and food prices, food producers and oil producers have done relatively well. Those which consume food and oil have done relatively badly. And that's being reflected now in the squeeze in the cost of living. But I would regard that as temporary. Those of us with uh, long enough memories of, of all this know that in the late 1970s and early 1980s, there was a huge surge in oil prices, and then they collapsed. By 1986, oil consumers were feeling very prosperous again, and oil producers like Texas and the US were struggling. So these things go in cycles, picking a point in the cycle and saying, this is a, a clear demonstration of, of the relative positions is a dangerous thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's a dangerous thing, but uh, if you look at the, you know, the major factors affecting economic performance, Ian, uh, you know, the story pointed out to this uh, the aging population, you know, uh, you know, preference for free time and job security, etc. Do you agree with them? Uh, these factors do play a role in probably the economic slowdown. 
Well, they undoubtedly do, because an aging population will tend to be less productive. The, as people move into retirement, they cease working, so the, the ratio of uh, dependence to those creating economic activity goes up, and that, can tend to, that tends to have a big influence. One example of this from further back is Japan, which from the, the late uh, early 1990s onwards, Japan had uh, two decades of relative stagnation. But when you go to Japan, you don't see poverty. You see people spreading the income in a different way, which is about the distribution of income rather than the generation of income. Uh, yes, uh, and uh, no, uh, you know, if you look at the, uh, the story, of course, there's an I mean, underlying uh, tone that is uh, obviously disapproval of the practice of people's uh, preference uh, in European countries for, for example, free time and job security. Uh, they, they mentioned the several stories of individuals of uh, uh, preferring like a 30 hour work week rather than 40 hour or longer hours of a work week. Uh, what do you make of that? I think it's always something important to keep in mind is what kind of life do you want? And the example you give of the, the four day weeks from, uh, from Germany, the fact that unions in some country have the feeling that what the members want, what their workers want is actually a better quality of life. is a sign that things are not necessarily that bad. So uh, it's, it's also the reason why I think a lot of people see those figures of GDP as very important measures, but cannot completely hide the fact that first you look at figures of GDP per capita when you compare countries, but distributions matter. So is the median person in the US so much better than the median person in Europe? It's a very different question than looking at averages. And also in terms of quality of life, you are looking at those figures saying, for instance, that every European country is poorer than uh, the top the bottom 20 uh, states in the US, sure, but would a European worker actually trade his life in Italy for a life in Alabama? So this is really about comparing apple and oranges sometimes. It's not to hide the fact that there's been sluggish growth in Europe, but if you ask people, would you be ready to trade your life in a European country for a life with maybe 20 or 30% more salary in the middle of Indiana? I'm not sure you would have a lot of people supporting that. Uh, and also adding to that, uh, I may say, you know, during this time of inflation uh, in the U.S. too, you know, people are struggling at least a bit uh, despite the economic aid, you know, the, the, the cash from the government. You know, ordinary folks are struggling with purchasing, with the shopping, uh, daily consumption too in the U.S., right? Yes, but there has been something that I think pretty peculiar to the way the U.S. has dealt, in particular with COVID, is by sending actually cash and checks to people. So people have received that cash money and it's a practice that is really frowned upon in Europe. So governments in Europe have come up with very elaborate scheme to subsidize directly, indirectly some businesses or uh, maybe give some money in exchange of buying energy, for instance. And so maybe it's felt a bit less direct. So for instance, if you look at France, where there has been so many demonstrations against the cost of living, the government has been spending billions to keep the energy price raised by only 4%, while in the rest of Europe it was much higher. But maybe people didn't get that sense that they were receiving the money from the government. In the US, you would receive a check in the post with written $3,000 in it. You see that you actually receive that money. And maybe in terms of perceptions, perception of poverty, perception of fairness of the system, it might have made quite a difference too. Mm -hmm. uh, different practices are there. Okay, of course, you know, because we are talking about the current state of uh, the government, the economy. I mean, there are, there are quite recent uh, I mean, factors and major factors affecting the economic performance. You have this COVID-19, you know, three years uh, closed down of, of the society, and then you have the Ukraine war, and uh, of course, uh, so all these uh, have added, I would say, problems or burden of uh, economic productivity. I would say, yeah, they have. Um, it, it's been a series of crises, really, uh, really that have um, been affecting global economies. Um, as you mentioned, the, uh, the COVID pandemic and then the war in Ukraine and the uh, spike in inflation and the spike in particular in energy prices. Um, and yeah, as Professor Bax has already said, um, in, in Europe, we're, um, we are energy net importers. And um, for many years, the, the economic model has relied on uh, importing cheap natural gas, cheap energy from um, from Russia, among other countries. And this has been uh, quite a challenge over the past two years to 
quickly adapt to that new reality where we don't want to import any more oil or natural gas from Russia and seek alternative supplies, whether that's from the US or whether that's from the Gulf states or from Africa. And I think, um, you know, credit to the European Union that has worked relatively well, I think. Uh, European gas consumers have reduced um, their usage of gas by around 18%, so even exceeding um, the, the targets that were set out by Brussels. Um, but going forward, it will remain quite a struggle because if you look at the industrial heartland, if you look at manufacturers in the Eurozone, they will have to contend with higher energy prices going forward. And there is um, a question about how competitive can you be in, compar in, in, in the global market in the comparison to the US, who are energy self-sufficient in comparison to Asia. Um, on the other hand, you also have a lot of policy action from the US. Um, we have the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, we have loads of subsidies that are trying to attract investment, trying to attract businesses to relocate to the US in order to um, benefit from these subsidies. And I think there is, you know, largely I want to agree that, you know, these, these comparisons can be exaggerated sometimes, but I also think, and I would want to say there is a real threat that um, going forward, the Eurozone and uh, the European Union um, might struggle to generate the growth that is necessary to, um, you know, deal with the global problems that we have with the climate crisis, with the aging population, um, because at the moment it's not quite clear where that growth momentum will come from. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Kate, uh, I, I assume the governments uh, uh, in, in Europe then they are fully aware of the problem or the challenges inside their economies and also from outside the uh, competitors. Competitors in this case, uh, Washington. Uh, in terms of the industrial policies, for example. So what are the governments doing to address these challenges? Yeah, certainly they are aware, but um, the difficulty here, of course, is that you know, the US is a, a single country, whereas the European Union, you know, it's, a, it's an agglomeration of countries. So it's, it's more difficult to find policies that all the members agree with and all the members can, can support. Um, we have also in the EU um, uh, programs that help to rebuild economies after the COVID shock, such as the, um, the Next Generation EU plan. So these are also around, I think, 400 billion um, euros of investment into clean energy, into renewable energies um, that are distributed among um, member, member states. But um, the question is, is it enough? Because in the, um, in the US, we've um, not only had the Inflation Reduction Act, we also had the CHIPS Act um, and another program by um, President Trump. So it's in total, I think, over $2 trillion of um, additional new investment over the next 10 years that have been unlocked or made available in the US. So we're talking really a different scale here of investment. Mm -hmm. And um, the European countries, I think, do need to ask themselves, you know, what is their position um, in this global competitive marketplace? Um, and of course, there's a, there's a worry that it, you, know, you don't want to end up in a subsidy race. Um, for example, in Germany, um, Germany attracted a new plant by Intel, the chip manufacturer, but that came at the cost of um, a 10 billion euro um, tax subsidy. So you do run the uh, danger that you end up in a, in a subsidies race um, and with increased protectionism, which would, at the end of the day, not benefit anybody. Um, but uh, it is a, it's, a, it's a very delicate situation at the moment for policymakers, certainly. Yeah, uh, no, you know, very delicate situation here, of course, in the global competition, uh, in particular from the U.S., for example, Inflation Reduction uh, Act here. And uh, so what's the, what's the response, what should be the response probably from the EU uh, as, a, as a block? Uh, you know, you want to avoid this, uh, uh, this risk of subsidies, uh, which will hurt the globalization and the free trade. Uh, but the atmosphere, I think, is quite clear in Washington that is increasingly against globalization and against free trade. What's the position of the European Union, for example? I think the difficulty is to know who is your friend at the moment in the world. So Europe has always sort of assumed that they were a natural ally with the US. And so when they were thinking about, we need some form of autonomy, so we don't need to rely too much on Russia, on China, um, talking about, of course, uh, the kind of components you need for semiconductor, chips, etc. In that kind of world, you can have a big block of Europe and the United States who together at least are, you know, the free trade block. But since President Trump, there is a fear in Europe that at any time, if Trump's come back or if someone like Trump's come back, you might have to be actually almost on your own. And so the reason why so much money is being spent, both by the US and both by Europe, 
in order to basically attract the same companies. So, um, we, we heard the case of the, the, the German factories. We are paying billions to take companies from each other. This is really ruining any chance of having a consistent joint strategy. So everyone wants to be, as Macron would say, a strategic um, autonomous, so not to depend on anyone else. But there are so many things going on in the world, so many potential enemies, so many potential difficulties in supply chains that we may actually be ruining largely our efforts uh, at the European level to that. And so I think perhaps a bit more faith in the ability of Europe to trade and the ability of Europe to keep that kind of multilateral uh, trade framework might avoid in part um, this waste of money and waste of uh, government resources just to uh, subsidy wars uh, with Americans. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, in that line, uh, of course, in the French uh, econ economy minister was in Beijing you know, this week talking about you know, his opposition to decoupling with the Chinese economy and uh, talked about uh, more cooperation with the Chinese side or investment from the Chinese side in the EV sector, for example, uh, economic, uh, the, 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 the new uh, renewable car industry there. Uh, so here, as you said, you know, it's more complicated now. Who is your friend? Who is your rival, for example? Uh, what's your view on this, uh, you know, the talk about de-risking? Uh, basically, the screening of investment, uh, you know, probably you know, going to China, all the Chinese investment in European countries? Geopolitically, you're aware of the hostility that's arisen over the last five or six years between the US and China. And Europe is to some extent caught in the middle. It tends, as has already been said, to uh, support the US rather than China. But at the same time, European businesses, governments and other interests recognize the importance of China as an economy with which to trade and which is a significant supplier to the European economy. There is a drift in Europe, to use the, the Macron expression of uh, strategic autonomy, to try to remedy this by building up domestic or domestic in the sense of European capacity. There are, there are plans floating around in Brussels at that moment to create a new sovereignty fund, which will be one kind of response to the Inflation Reduction Act. But at the moment, it's very vague what that's going to be. The, the policy challenge is on the table. The policy solutions still have not been fully articulated, and that's the the current position in Brussels as they try to struggle with this. I mean, Germany obviously is the largest economy and it carries a, a lot of weight in terms of for the economic performance of the entire continent, let's say. Uh, so how does the German economy right now, you know, we are talking about the teetering of uh, a recession. Uh, what's the effect of the uh, German economy or weak weakness, uh, you know, affecting probably the rest of the European economies here. Uh, Kay, please. Yeah, sure. Um, so the German economy is uh, certainly in a, in a difficult spot. As I've said, um, they haven't recorded any growth since Q3 2022. Um, the, the car manufacturers are under massive pressure at the moment. Uh, on the one hand, you have Chinese car manufacturers who really you know, um, leapfrog them in terms of the um, electric vehicle technology. And uh, I think Chinese um, car manufacturers are also becoming more successful in exporting their vehicles to, to, to markets abroad. So that's really a, a change of roles there. Um, on the other hand, you know, you have um, German industry who has been uh, very much relying on, on, on cheap uh, Russian gas. So with the absence of that uh, energy carrier, it's, it's really a question of how much of um, the metal industry, you know, the chemical industry, uh, how much of that is viable in the long term without any uh, further state help. And then I guess politically, there's also a question in, um, you know, Germany, of course, is the largest uh, economy in the Eurozone, has a very big influence on about kind of the general aggregate demand in the Eurozone, in an uh, Eurozone condition. And um, I think here, uh, the political coalition in Germany at the moment is unfortunately um, it doesn't seem willing to acknowledge the situation that there is, you know, um, really a lack of growth in the economy at the moment and that uh, a bigger investment program nationally would be required. If, if, that would, if that were to happen, that would also have benefits for, for the other European countries because, you know, Germany also buys imports and materials and intermediate goods from, from other European countries. 
but there seems to be um, due to the coalition partner who's in charge of the uh, finance ministry, um, you know, the thinking that you can just go back to the rules that Germany um, used to follow prior to the COVID pandemic, um, which is, you know, have a very small deficit or ideally a budget surplus. Um, it was probably already a mistake back in the day, and I think um, it's, it's, it's a mistake now. Um, so we'll, we'll have to see, but it's um, um, yeah, certainly a, a very important factor, not only for the German economy, but also for the European economy and the growth outlook. Mm -hmm. uh, so I know, uh, for Kai, you know, if you take uh, all the fact factors, I would say, into consideration, you know, domestically and uh, the uncertainty, let's say, in terms of relationship, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the global competition, uh, what do you see the prospect uh, for the European economy, for example, in the next five to ten years? I think if, uh, if I want to be optimistic, the first thing Europe needs to do is to be stronger in what it does the best, which is free trade and regulation for the world. People need to see Europe as this very big single market in which you want to invest and that will then somehow uh, be the, the leader for the rules that the other ones will follow. In that sense, Europe can keep its relevance. My fear is that it doesn't happen like that. If we go back to more protectionism, more say, nationalist stance, it might be much more difficult. But Europe being a relatively small in terms of population, relatively aging, it can find its way only through innovating, regulating, and being relevant to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, Ian Bag, if you look at the globally, the competition, I mean, we can say there is a competition, uh, the major economies, uh, uh, European economies, uh, the United States, China, you know, India, and uh, other large developing nations. Uh, so uh, what kind of a future do you see, in, in particular in the near future, for the European economies? Well, the European economy will see its share of global economic activity continue to decline. But we shouldn't fear that. It's, it, it's a consequence of countries like China becoming richer, that those who are competing with, with China become less uh, a lower share of global economic activity. We should welcome the fact that India is next probably to reach a, a development threshold as China has done, and that some of Southeast Asia is going in the same direction. It doesn't make Europeans worse off. It just means that compared with everybody else, they don't seem to be as well off as they used to be. And I think that's an important message both to send to Europeans who might be concerned about these rather misleading statistics we've been talking about, but also to policymakers who shouldn't fret unduly about coming down the, league, the international league tables. I mentioned earlier the case of Japan. Japan is not somewhere where you feel uncomfortable. It's not somewhere where, where it looks as though there's massive poverty going on. They have solved the problem of slow growth and find ways of distributing that slow growth among their population in a far more equitable way than some of the countries which are at the top of the league tables, including the US. The degree of inequality in the US is something we've not really touched on, but it's a real shame on that country that inequality is so extensive in the way it is. And of course, there are also other factors I think they are critical in offsetting the problems or the challenges like aging population, for example, automation and AI, uh, the use of AI in helping increase uh, the productivity. Uh, on that note, we come to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. Thank you for being with us. I'm Xu Qinduo. See you next time.